What's more beautiful than a bride? I've been to a lot of weddings in my day, and every bride is amazing, especially that moment when she arrives at the back of the church and all the guests stand. And what's even better is the look on the bridegroom's face, the moment that he sees her and knows that she's coming to meet him. Welcome to Through the Bible. A wedding forms the backdrop in Dr. McGee's sermon today titled, Behold the Bridegroom Cometh. Now, as you open your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, we've got time to share one letter from the Bible bus. This one is from Rick, and he writes, One day while sitting in my truck at work, I wandered through the radio stations looking for something that was not music. Well, once I heard Dr. J. Vernon McGee's voice, I stopped searching. All because of the way he speaks. A slow and very well-pronounced word. All because my hearing is not that good. But I could understand every word. My reading skills were never real good, so picking up a Bible to me was like reading a foreign language. Once I came home and looked on the Internet and saw his Bible bus, I was all set. I could click on every chapter and study along with him and understand. After hearing letters from people living in dangerous places, I realized that I am very blessed to be able to follow Jesus without anyone wanting to kill me for it. I feel so bad for all my brothers and sisters that have to hide away to follow the good Lord's word. Being part of the World Prayer Team gives me a whole new outlook on everything in everyday life. I consider it one of the great privileges of my life to pray with you all. Rick, that's so encouraging to us. And yes, I too consider it a privilege to pray with the World Prayer Team. And if you'd like to join us, Rick and myself and thousands of others, sign up at ttb.org forward slash pray. You'll get a short email every weekday that'll give you a picture into what God is doing in some country near or far. And you'll see, like Rick and me, that it's a real joy to play a part in God's work around the world. Do you have your Bible open to John 14? Good. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, thank you for blessing your word today as it goes out and touches lives, beginning with ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's the Sunday Sermon with Dr. J. Vernon McGee on Through the Bible. So tonight I'm going to turn to probably the most familiar chapter in the Bible, and read just about three verses there to get us started. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, I know that there are those that are saying, you don't mean to tell me that you're going to begin with the most familiar chapter in the Bible that we are all familiar with. We already know all about John 14. Why don't you go to something else? Well, I always think when I turn to John 14 and use it for a message that Well, it's like the little story that Dr. Ironside used to tell about the little boy that was brought up on the east side in New York City, and his mother and father died when he was just a little fellow, and he was passed from one relative to another. No one wanted him. No one loved him. And the little fellow, he uh, he just sprung up. And finally, when he started to school, His teacher showed an interest in him and a love and affection. And the little fellow responded to that, and he just opened up like a flower. And so he wanted to do something for his teacher, but he didn't know what he could do. But one morning, walking to school, he saw ahead of him a great big orange roll off of a fruit stand, across the sidewalk, down in the gutter. And it was one of these great big California Riverside naval oranges, the like of which has not been seen. And so the little fellow made a dive for that orange. And he took it up and wiped it on his dirty little pants. 
And he started to school, and he said, I'll take this to my teacher. But on the way, he got interested in the orange. He actually had never uh, eaten an orange in his life. And so his grimy little finger worked its way down into the orange. And by the time he got to school, it was pretty well shop-worn. Fact of the matter is, it looked like a Florida orange at that time. (laughs) And I trust that these folk from Orlando, Florida will forgive me for saying that. But nevertheless, the little fella, he took the orange, and where it was pushed in, he pushed it back out. And he tried to make it round, and he did the best he could. And what the orange lacked, he made up with bravado, and he walked in and he pushed it out to his teacher. He said, look what I brung you. And she was reluctant to take it, and he said, oh, go ahead and take it. It's got a lot of squirrels left in it yet. (laughs) And so when we finish tonight, why, John 14 will still have a lot of squirrels left in it yet. You can be sure of that. Now, the Lord Jesus gave four major discourses, and they are major discourses because of the content of them, the extent of them, and the intent of them. Three of them are in the Gospel of Matthew in their larger extent. One is called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The other is the Mystery Parable Discourse, Matthew 13. And then the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. But the fourth discourse is found in the Gospel of John and there alone. And it is John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Now the Lord Jesus took his own in the upper room, and in each one of these chapters, he revealed to them something new. That is something that had never been revealed before. Something you will not find in the Old Testament at all. And in the upper room, he revealed these things to them. Now, here in John 14, actually there are two wonderful things that he revealed to his own. And the first one is this. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And this is what is brand new. That he's going away from this earth. And he's going back to the Father. And he's going to prepare a place for his own. He's going to take them to a place that's not confined to this earth at all. And when he said that, he introduced the space age. And he began immediately to put on the launching pad of faith a group of people, the body of believers, the church, that one of these days will take off from this earth. And that, may I say, is the first time it's revealed. You don't find that in the Old Testament. God never told Abraham, I'm going to take you out yonder, somewhere where the stars are. He said to Abraham, I'll make your offspring as numberless as the stars, but I'm not taking you to a star. I'm giving you a piece of real estate down here on this earth. And tonight, that piece of real estate is the most sensitive piece of real estate in the world. And it could well trigger World War III. And it's the belief right now of a great many that that might happen. So that uh, God never said to these men that I'm going to take you away from this earth. I'm going to bring the kingdom of heaven down to this earth. And that's what that expression means, I think, uh, that it means the establishment of a kingdom here on this earth. That was Abraham's hope. When his wife Sarah died, he went to the sons of Heth and he said, I want to buy the cave of Machpelah to bury my dead. And they said, you're a good neighbor, Abraham. We're going to give you the cave. He says, you're giving me nothing. I'll pay you for it. Because when I get it someday... God will give it to me, and he'll raise me from the dead. His wife Sarah's buried there. He's buried there. Isaac is buried there. And Leah is buried there. And Rebecca's buried there. And old Jacob is buried there when he was dying in the land of Egypt. 
He made his son Joseph take an oath. He said to him, Don't bury me in Egypt. Take me up yonder and bury me with my fathers. And that's where he's buried. And that, uh, that mosque there in Hebron is over the graves of these. And their hope was not to go to heaven. Their hope was they were to be raised down here for a kingdom that's going to be established on this earth. And when Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness, he could sing, I'm bound for the promised land. But when I hear a group of believers today sing that, I just wonder sometime where they think they're going. Uh, I'm bound for the promised land. Where are you going when you sing that? May I say to you, Moses could sing it. But you and I today are bound to the, the new Jerusalem the city of God that's coming down someday from God out of heaven, and that is the eternal home of the church. And may I say to you that this, therefore, was the first time it's mentioned, and you'll find out it's mentioned many times in the New Testament after this by the writers in the New Testament. Then there's something else here, and that is the thing I want to dwell on tonight. And we need to... Uh, to understand what uh, really the Lord Jesus has in mind when he uses the language here that he does. He places it on the background of a Jewish wedding in his day. And uh, it is a bride and groom situation. And uh, actually, I felt for years that it was there, but I never could pick it out. Uh, but you'll find that the writers in the New Testament, all who understood what he was talking about, they began to use the figure. And there are many figures that explain the relationship of Christ and his church. And one is bridegroom and bride. You find that Paul the Apostle, when he wrote to the Corinthians, Second Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, he says... For I am jealous over you with godly jealous. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. May I say to, to you that is a figure of speech that, that Paul used, uh, that I am, I am uh, making you engaged, as it were. I'm bringing you into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll find that John in Revelation used that figure of speech because after you get through all of that great tribulation period, you find that the bride is in heaven and we find that John writes, the marriage of the Lamb has come. And he uses that figure of speech. And James the very practical apostle, he, he uses it in a negative way. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In other words, he's saying that unfaithfulness to Christ on the part of a believer is likened to adultery. And we need to understand, therefore, the custom of a Jewish wedding of that day in order to understand what he's talking about here in John 14. And I want to say tonight that I am deeply indebted to Dr. Showers of the Philadelphia College of the Bible. He is the man who has done some very wonderful research in this connection, and he has made it available to me, and I deeply appreciate that because I have wanted this information for years. And I want you to notice what a wedding was in the first century in the days of our Lord, the steps that were taken. And it was not a day that the bride brought a dowry when she was married. In fact, the matter is, that was not a Bible custom. That came along much later. After all, what was the, the dowry that Eve brought to Adam? The fact of the matter is, she didn't bring a dowry to him at all. 
She brought herself, and I think she was probably the most wonderful woman that's ever been on this earth. Believe me, Adam was a lucky man. And, uh, but uh, he paid a price for her. He's the one that paid a price. He gave a rib for her. And you know, the way it's come about, Adam's rib, Satan's fib, and women's lib. <laughs> now, in a first century wedding, the initial step was taken by the young man who had fallen in love with some girl. It wasn't on the part of a girl bringing a dowry to anybody. What happened was this. When he had fallen in love with the girl and knew that she would marry him, he left his father's house. He went to the girl's house, and he bargained with the father of the girl about how much he would pay for the girl. And the purchase price that he was to pay for his bride is called a mohar. And uh, the mohar was agreed upon. That is, that would be mutually satisfactory to the father and also to the young man. And then the young lady was called, and if it was satisfactory with her, a marriage covenant was made. The bride was then declared to be sanctified. And that only means that she was set apart for the bridegroom. And uh, that is the picture that you have at the opening of the New Testament, that uh, Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Uh, they, they had gone through the betrothal service. Now, this betrothal service was actually like a marriage service. It was concluded by the prospective bridegroom and bride taking a glass of wine, and each drank from it. And this was called a betrothal ceremony. Uh, she's now espoused to him. And then the betrothal benediction was pronounced. And then the young man returned to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride in his father's house. Now the bride-to-be, she prepared herself to become a bride and to enter married life. Now this was the first stage, and I'm sure that by now you've recognized the parallel to Christ and his church. Nineteen hundred years ago, he left the ivory palaces of heaven. He left his father's house, and he came to the woe of this world to seek a bride. He left the father's house to come to our house, this world that you and I live in. And in John 16, 28, he gave us this tremendous movement. Many consider this, many expositors consider John 16, 28 as the key to the gospel. And they're not far amiss, by the way. The Lord Jesus says there, I am come forth from the Father, and, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and I go to the Father. Tremendous movement out of the glories of heaven and down to this earth for just a brief period of time. John Wesley put it like this, God contracted to a span, and then, having made the engagement down here, he goes back to heaven to prepare a place for his bride. And that's the picture that you have in John. He opens the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then he begins to move. And in John, 4, uh, John 1, 14, he says, The Word w became or was born flesh. And he pitched his tent, that is, a body. Pitched this human tent here amongst us. He became one of us when he came down to this earth. Greek philosophy would accept the first statement, but never would have accepted the second. 
when the Word became flesh. And then he continues in John 1, 18, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, exegeted him, exago. He's led him out where man can see God for the first time. And the Lord Jesus said to Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Not 99 and 44, 100% God, but 100% God. And the writer to the Hebrews comes along and says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. And then in verse 14 of that chapter, he says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, that is the wonderful and glorious picture of him coming from the Father's house down to our house and becoming a man. And when he came down here, he paid a price to get a bride. And that price, he explains in Mark 10, 45, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He paid a price for you and me. That word ransom, it went out of the English language for a long time. It wasn't in our vocabulary. You didn't hear anything about it. And they tried to get rid of it. But believe me, the kidnappers have really put it back in use again. And one rich child after another has been kidnapped, and a ransom has been demanded. And I remember when Mr. Geddes' son, you will recall, grandson, was kidnapped. He's supposed to be the richest man in the world. And you remember they, uh, they demanded a tremendous ransom, and then they showed a picture of that boy on TV. And I want to tell you, when I saw the picture of that boy, if he paid over 10 cents for that fella, he got cheated. Because that boy was certainly a worthless-looking fella. And as I looked at him on TV, I thought, my millions was paid for that fella. And then I was caught up that I've been ransomed also. And a tremendous price was paid for me. And if you want to know something, I was not worthy. I like that song. I wasn't worthy. I wasn't worth that. And neither were you. Someone has said that if we could see ourselves tonight as God sees us, we couldn't stand ourselves. My friend, what a price has been paid for you and me. We were alienated from God. Paul said to the Ephesians, you were without hope and without God in the world. Dead in trespasses and sins. And he came down and paid a price. And what price did he pay? Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, Received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He paid a tremendous price. Now he sealed the betrothal yonder in the upper room. There on the dying embers of a fading feast, the Passover, he reared a new feast. And after the cup had passed for the Passover, he took the cup up again, and he says, as Paul puts it, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. He took that cup that night in which he was betrayed, 
That night, which was the night before he was arrested and brought up and crucified the next day, and in four days from that night he rose from the dead, and he said, This cup is a new covenant. In my blood, I paid a price for you, and that's a betrothal. And my friend, when you go to the Lord's table, and I wish Christians today had a higher view of the Lord's table than they do. May I say, when you and I take that cup, we're responding to him, and we're saying to him, we belong to you. You paid a price for us. You've redeemed us. It's a pledge of allegiance on our part to him when you take that cup. He took the cup that spoke of his blood that he'd pay for your redemption and my redemption. And now you and I take the cup, and it's a pledge on our part. I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of cheap Christianity today. I'm so tired of seeing people play church today. I'm so tired today of shoddy sanctification. I'm so tired of hearing about dead dedication. I hear today so many people say, I'm dedicated to Christ. You're not dedicated to him unless you're married to him, unless you're joined to him. My, how low we have let this thing sink in our day. Now, will you notice after the bridegroom had uh, made the pledge, he went back to his father's house. And the Lord Jesus says here, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And on the back background of that wedding of that day, the custom in that wedding, he makes this statement. He says to every believer, I'm putting you in the body of believers, the church, and that church is to be my bride, and I'm coming someday for the bride, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Well, I don't like that term. I live for many years, well, not too many, but seem long in what the denomination I was brought up in, which was Presbyterian. And uh, they put their preacher in a place called a manse. It's short form for mansion. And my friend, I have lived in some most unusual mansions in my day. When I went to my first church in Nashville, Tennessee, and Miss Davidson sitting down here, she's from Nashville. She knows that old Second Presbyterian Church and the old manse there. It was an antebellum home, had 14 rooms in it. And on a clear day, I used to tell the folk you could see the ceiling in the living room. It was a big thing. And I can remember that on a cold day, all I had was a little fireplace, and I'd burn coal. And I'd burn on one side and freeze on the other. <laughs> then I'd turn around and reverse the process. And, and when anybody tells me that I'm going to have a mansion over there, well, <clears throat> may I say to you, you leave me cold. I don't want it. I don't want a mansion. And I thank God that's not what he said. He says, in my father's house are many moni. Moni doesn't mean mansion any more than it means uh, a doghouse. It, it only means one thing. It means abiding place. And what does he mean when he says, in my father's house? Well, when you go out of here tonight and look up, and I hope you can look up and see the stars, if you can, you'll be looking into my father's house. That's, out, that's the, his house up there. It's a big house. And he says there are many abiding places. 
And when he said that man did know something, the Egyptians knew something about our solar system. They knew the distance to the sun. And they knew we were in a solar system, but they knew nothing about what was beyond. And then Galileo came along with a telescope, and they discovered that beyond our planetary system, there are other planetary systems, and we all together form a galactic system. And then they began to make uh, other telescopes, and they found out that beyond our galactic system, there are other galactic systems. And then they found out that beyond the galactic systems, there's something else. And with this great big uh, dish that they've got up here on the Mojave Desert, they found out that there are those way out there, and they call them quasars. I asked a friend of mine, I said, why do you call them quasars? He says, quasars, a German word, means that you don't know what it is. And But it, it sounds scientific to say, you know, those are quasars. And when I say that, somebody says, my, isn't that preacher smart? He knows what those are. But when you say quasar, what you're really saying is, I don't know what it is. And now the, the British have a bigger dish than we've got, and they found something beyond the quasars. And the British always come up with a good one. They call them blocks. And that, my friend, is the best scientific term I've heard yet. They're blocks. The Lord Jesus that night said, In my Father's house there are many abiding places. But I go to prepare a place for you. The bridegroom has gone back to the Father's house to prepare a place for the bride. And one of these days, he's coming. And that brings us to the second stage or phase of a first century marriage. Now, will you notice this? When the bridegroom returned back to the father's house to prepare a place for the bride, he did not return immediately. It was at least a year. Could be even less, but generally a year or more. And the more was something that the bride knew nothing about. No date was ever set. For his return. No advance word was given. The bride was to wait in anticipation, in expectation, and preparation. And that leads me now to say again that we are not given any sign today about the rapture of the church. None whatsoever. Any more than this. This bride was told when the bridegroom would return, she did not know. She was to anticipate his coming. She was to expect it. She was to prepare for it. Then one day, at the time decided upon by the bridegroom and by him alone, he came to take the bride to live with him. It was generally at night. And male escorts came with him. And when he got within earshot of the home of the bride, he shouted. And that was the first inkling and the first indication that she had that he was coming. And once somebody tries to tell me, even that he's coming soon, that's very unscriptural. He never said that. Somebody says, he said, behold, I come quickly. That's in the book of Revelation. He says all those great events in Revelation are going to happen quickly. That's all he's saying there. He didn't say, I'm coming soon. If he did say that, I don't know what he meant, because it's been 1,900 years. But when the bridegroom in that first century wedding, when he got near the house, he shouted, and that was her first word. The shout announced... His arrival. And this was the first, let me repeat it, the first indication or inkling that she had that he was coming. He didn't write a letter 
saying he would be there on a certain date, September the 5th, 1975. He didn't write that. He did not send some sensational preacher to announce the date and say that now that the planets have all got in a line with Jupiter, that means Jesus is coming. He never said that. He never said that uh, because Israel's back in the land, that means I'm coming soon. He never said that. He didn't say write a book and set a few dates, and it'll sure sell books, but I'm not, I won't be there on that day. And he didn't come on the date that the book said. And listen to me carefully. He did not say the king is coming. There's more wrong theology given in songs today than any other way. I wish songwriters knew a little about the Bible before they'd write songs. He didn't say the king is coming. Will you hear me carefully? He says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And he's coming as the bridegroom to take his church out before he comes to this earth to establish his kingdom. And now will you listen to him? He says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And on that basis, Paul wrote in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Someone said that listens to me, says, I don't think you believe in holiness. Well, I don't believe in it here because I don't see any of it here. But one of these days, I'm going to be holy. Boy, won't that be a day to look at Vernon McGee. I'm going to be different than I am now. And don't get alarmed. If Really, if you knew me like I know myself, you would not sit there and listen to me. But wait just a minute. Don't get up, because if I knew you like you know yourself, I wouldn't speak to you. <laughs> and will you listen again? In Revelation 19, John picks this up. He says, let us be, get, be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. How did she make herself ready? At the rapture we are brought into the presence of Christ, and rewards are given. Rewards are given for service to him. That's going to be a wonderful day, and then we'll be reunited with our loved ones. Won't it be wonderful to see mother and dad, if they will believe us? Won't it be wonderful to see that little child that you lost? Won't it be wonderful to see that husband or that wife? Tuesday night, they're sat right over there, a woman that's just been a widow for a week. Her husband was the one and the son killed in that plane accident out here. And uh, she was here Tuesday night. Uh, One day she'll be reunited to him. That's going to take place at the rapture. And uh, after that period, the wonderful thing that's going to happen then, the marriage is coming. I believe the marriage is in heaven. The marriage supper is on earth. But the bridegroom takes the bride to his home, that's the next step, to the room that's prepared that's called a huppa. That's where the Lord Jesus is going to take his bride to give out the rewards to review your life and my life someday. And the friends that were with him, they're going to wait on the outside. And that's what John the Baptist meant when he said, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. You see, they asked him if he was the Messiah. He said, oh, no. 
He said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. John the Baptist was never in the church. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he introduced the Lord Jesus. And he says, I'm not the bridegroom. I, I don't have the bride. But I'm a friend of the bridegroom, and he's going to be there. Now, after the bride and bridegroom have entered the hapa, the bridegroom comes out and announces that there has been the physical consummation of the wedding. And then there are seven days of celebration on the part of the friends, and the bride is not revealed during that period at all. Seven days of years of celebration in heaven, uh, being with our loved ones, being with the Lord Jesus. I personally can't even conceive how wonderful that's going to be. But what's taking place on earth? Seven days or seven years of days of tribulation on earth. And this time the bride is hidden in the bride chamber with the bridegroom. And he made that clear when he wrote to the church in Philadelphia. He said in Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation or testing which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And believe me, the amillennialists and the, and the post-trib, uh, they have really had their problems with this verse. And their interpretations make me know that they're wrong. They have gone to any length to misinterpret this verse, and it means exactly what it says. He says, I'll keep you, the church, from that hour of testing that's coming upon the earth. And you can't get anything else out of that. Now, I want to close on this note. Many years ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse got up something that was rather sensational. He got up a marriage between Christ and his church, that is, a ritual. And tonight, I want to pass on to you the part that the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, has said, and then the part that the sinner says when he comes to Christ. I'd like for you to hear it. I, Jesus, take thee, sinner, to be my bride. And I do promise and covenant before God the Father and these witnesses to be thy loving and faithful Savior and bridegroom in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in faithfulness and in waywardness for time and for eternity. And then here is what? The sinner is to say, will you listen to this? I, sinner, take thee, Jesus, to be my Savior. And I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be thy loving and faithful bride in sickness and in health, in plenty and in want, and in joy and in sorrow for time and for eternity. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the thing that's important. Well, that's a meaningful way to picture Jesus' commitment to us, isn't it? Is Jesus your bridegroom? If you'd like to know more about what it means to have this relationship with Jesus Christ, go to ttb.org and click on How Can I Know God? Today's sermon was titled, Behold, the Bridegroom Cometh, and is available for purchase on a single CD. It's also a chapter in Dr. McGee's book, Marriage and Divorce. You can order these resources online at ttb.org or by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, as we all wait with love for the Lord's appearing, we pray that he will fill you with his grace as you walk with him today. 
We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.